Well, as we pick up today from last week, let's kind of review where we are because it's uh, kind of important. Mark is writing to us the eyewitness account of Peter. Mark starts with the baptism of John the Baptist starting his ministry. He starts his ministry. He ministers for about six months, and Jesus shows up to be baptized. Now, Mark doesn't tell us all that stuff about why, because it's not important to the Roman reader. But when we get to one of the other Gospels, which is where we're headed, we're going to find out when Jesus shows up, John the Baptist says, I am not even worthy to tie your shoe. I cannot baptize you. And Jesus says, yes, you must baptize me, and I'm going to be baptized by you. And sure enough, G John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And John is pointing everyone to Jesus. He is baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, but there is one coming greater than I. And when he comes, all of John the Baptist's followers are supposed to follow Jesus. You got that picture? And finally, Jesus shows up six months into John's ministry. John baptizes and says, behold, the Lamb of God saying, this is the one. This is the one I've been telling you about. This is who I am. This is what I've been sent here for is to point people to the Messiah who has just showed up, the Lamb of God. From the baptism, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And after the wilderness, he is tempted by Satan with three temptations. Mark does not tell us about any of the of the details of that. We have to go to Matthew chapter 4 to find out the details. John, Mark just tells it because it's important for the Romans to understand that temptations are going to come. Then we have an interlude of 18 months before the next thing that Mark says to us. Why 18 months? Because Peter and Andrew, James and John were disciples of John the Baptist. Peter, disciple of John the Baptist, knew about John's ministry. He knew about the baptism of Jesus, and he knew about the wilderness experience because he was associated with John the Baptist. He did not know about the events that transpired over the next 18 months because John, Peter has gone back to pay for the livelihood of his family. He had to go back fishing, just like Andrew had to go back fishing. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had to go back fishing to pay for and help take care. I mean, you just couldn't drop everything. Folks, folks, we all know people who they've come to know the Lord or they've come to make a decision and they drop everything. Drop everything. Oh, I feel God calling me to, to, to leave my job. God never tells you to leave your job unless he has another job for you to go to. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to get laid off by somebody because of their having to rearrange what they have done. It doesn't mean that you may not get fired because you have a, a different arrangements, a different opinions about things uh, than the boss has. And the boss has every right to fire you. The boss has every right to lay you off if, if whatever the reasons are. And you may not agree with that, but guess what? If you're doing okay in a job, God is never saying to you, go leave this job with nothing else to do. Now, if he's calling you to someplace else, that's a whole different ball game. If he's got plans for you and he's told you what those plans are, you know, if, if God is calling you to, to go uh, start up a business and you have the resources to do that, then you leave the job and go start up the business and, and get at it. So you have to be careful with that. Well, J Peter knows about this and he's an eyewitness and he tells Mark about it. But he can't tell him about the 18 months. So Mark skips to the Galilean ministry when Jesus moves to Galilee. Now Jesus moves to Galilee, if you remember, uh, and, and because John the Baptist needs to be put into prison. You got that? Did you hear me? John the Baptist needs to be put into prison. John the Baptist must be taken out of the way. John the Baptist has hundreds of followers who have been baptized by him and are still following John the Baptist. John the Baptist all along is pointing towards the Lord, but the people are not leaving. Peter and Andrew, James and John had not followed the Lord during the 18 months of ministry. They could have, but they didn't. Uh, others have not done it. Apollos, you got that Apollos. Whenever Apollos, when Paul is writing to one of the families in one of the letters, 
uh, he, the people have asked, who have you been baptized by? I've been baptized by Apollos into the baptism of John. Apollos says, uh, when, he is bapt when he is questioned about that, Apollos, who were you baptized? I was baptized into the baptism of John for the repentance of my sin. Well, were you baptized for, uh, into the baptism to belief in Jesus? Well, who is, Je who is Jesus? Apollos has been out there just preaching the gospel, the baptism for repentance of sin, according to John's baptism, for all these 14, 15, 16, 17 years. He's not heard about Jesus yet. And finally, somebody pulls him off and says, listen, here's the story of Jesus. And Apollos turns and begins preaching. And he was a wonderful speaker and a wonderful preacher and becomes being a fellow minister with Paul. But it took 14, 15, maybe even 17 years from the time he was baptized by John the Baptist until he heard about Jesus and changed from following John the Baptist. Same thing happened with Peter. John the Baptist is put in jail and is going to die so that he is out of the way so that all of his followers can turn and go towards Jesus and follow Jesus. Because that's what John the Baptist was here for, the forerunner to point people towards Jesus. Jesus leaves the area of Judea. John is put into jail by Herod. Herod just loves John the Baptist. He is such a hoot for Herod. Herod, go down and talk to him. In fact, the text, the scripture, if you remember last week, even told us that whenever, uh, or the scripture tells us, that whenever John the ba uh, Herod finally puts John the Baptist to death, he is saddened by it because he enjoyed it. John the Baptist. He enjoyed his time with him even though he was in jail. And the problem was is Herod had this daughter by the name of Salome. And Salome has this birthday party. And what does she want for her birthday? <laughs> now if you have a daughter like this, I think you probably need to think about what you're going to do, like uh, put her on a permanent cruise somewhere or whatever, because Salome comes up to Daddy and says, Herod, listen, Herod, Daddy, uh, what I really want is I, is I, I want um, John the Baptist's head on a silver platter. What a gift. You can put that up on your shelf and look at it every day. I mean, think about it. What? Ugh. But that's what she wanted. It kind of upset Herod that he had to do it, but he did it anyway, and he gave her John the Baptist's head. He's out of the way. The news gets to Jesus. Jesus is grieved over it, but Jesus knew that it had to happen. And the followers will begin now turning and going towards Jesus. Jesus moves to Galilee. First thing right off the bat, he goes in the synagogue. He heals a man of, who is demon-possessed, casts the demon out. And the demons go out of him. And lo and behold, the demons know who Jesus is. Did you remember that? The demons said, What would you have to do with me, son of the Most High God? The demons knew Jesus. Jesus knew the demons. The rabbis didn't know who Jesus was. The people, a lot of people didn't know who Jesus was, but the demons knew who it was because he's the creator of heaven and earth. He created the angels who made the decision to not follow God's will, but left their place of responsibility and followed after Satan and what Satan wanted to do and became demons. And good angels became bad angels. And bad angels are called demons. They're both angels, created creatures who have seen the throne of God, seen God the Father standing on the throne, and have no opportunity for salvation once they choose to leave the presence of God. Well, they go and they have uh, taken up residency in this man. They recognize it, and Jesus says, Don't call me Son of God. Don't tell anybody. I don't need your testimony at all. If you remember... Uh, you wouldn't want to hear that testimony either because when a person is demon-possessed, they are crazy, just crazy. Now, if you know a person who's crazy and they come up and tell you something like it's with authority and like it's truth, are you going to believe them? No, because you know they're crazy. All of you, every one of you has somebody in your family that's crazy. Now, it may not be your lo local family, but it's, you know, your extended family, and you show up for Thanksgiving, you show up for Christmas, or some family reunion, and everything is going great. There's 20, 25 of you, 30 of you there. Everything's going good. You're eating your barbecue, your cold slaw, your baked beans, and lo and behold, here drives up a car, and everybody at that family gathering goes, looks at the car and goes, Ugh. nobody says a word. 
They get out of their car, their family, their blood. They come over. They just start filling their plate. They pile their plate about yay high. There's nothing left for anybody else. They sit down and start spouting words out of their mouth, and everybody's going, oh, mm, 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 mm. And you just endure them. How many of y'all have family members like that? <laughs> can I get a testimony? Testi uh, how do they say it? Can I get a testimony? <laughs> yeah, I can see it. All the way back at the back, I see hands all over this auditorium. That's right. Yes, there are hands. Yes. And, and if you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. Because <laughs> you know you got one. They may be sitting next to you. That's the reason why you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> That's right. They're crazy. They're demon possessed. Jesus says, don't proclaim to anyone who I am. Don't tell this testimony. I don't need that testimony. He wanted a testimony of people who really and truly have been changed by the Lord. Well, Next thing that happens is after he does that demon-possessed thing and heals on the Sabbath, the word gets out in Galilee. Now, Jesus has already been to Galilee for a short period of time. During this 18 months, he has testified, according to John's gospel, he's been in Perea, he's been in Judea for most of the time, but he did the southern part of Galilee too. So he has made his way up to Galilee, and he's, so everybody knows who he is. They've all heard about him. And so here he is, and he has healed this man, the demon, on the Sabbath. And oh my, as Jesus goes to Peter's house to have a meal, the people leave from the synagogue, and that's the morning type deal, and everybody's telling everybody. Jesus goes to Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is ill and sick, and Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Now, she was a good mother-in-law that every one of y'all, you her mother-in-laws, ought to take her example. She got up out of that bed where she was sick when she got healed, and she started fixing meals and serving them. Okay, you got that? <laughs> Don't wait on your husbands to go fix the meals. The important thing for you to understand here is Peter was married. Peter was married. He had a wife. He had a mother-in-law he cared for. And Jesus healed her, and she gets up. Well, with that said, Jesus is not out of the woods because the word is out on this Sabbath. This first Sabbath, he's in Galilee. The word is out, and people start saying, where is Jesus? And they find him at Peter's house. And that's where we pick up on verse 32. And when evening had come after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. He's the demon-possessed healer. Why? Because he had just done it that morning. So the family started gathering up all their family members who were demon-possessed. You got what's going on here? They're not waiting until the next family gathering or holiday when they're gathering up saying, Hey, we got to get our relatives that are loco and get them to Jesus because <laughs> Jesus can heal them. And so they start bringing them because they're demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. You got that? The whole city. The city is at one house. Everybody in Capernaum, the little fishing town, is at one location. They were at Peter's house. And he healed many who were ill with various disease and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. They knew that he was God. He didn't want that testimony yet. He didn't want that testimony for them. He didn't want testimonies from crazy people who were demon-possessed, who had been healed, because people wouldn't even, oh, he just, he's just having a momentary lapse of insanity. Did you catch that? Momentary lapse of insanity? Not of saneness. He's not mo momentarily going sane. He's just, uh, yeah, he's just momentarily going sane. That's what I mean. You know, he's, he's just for point in time, he's, he'll, he'll go back to like he was. You know, it's kind of like arthritis. Arthritis will go away for a couple of hours. Then it comes back with a vengeance. You know what I'm talking about. And you can put all the WD-40 you want on it. It doesn't help. I've tried. Spray a whole can up and down the hip and down the side. Rub it in, rub it in. You know, let the tingle begin. It doesn't help at all. Only the healing hand of God can help there. The demons, he didn't want to talk. Verse 35. 
So that night as night came, and early the next morning, while it was still dark, he arose and went out and departed to a lonely place and was praying there. Lonely place. That means he was by himself. It wasn't that he was lonely. He went out to be by himself. And he was out there. Now, the way the scripture reads this, the original text, it lets us know that he's probably sometime between the, the time of 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. Between 3 a.m., and 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, only people who go to bed at 7 o'clock get up at that time in the morning. Did you know that? And if you think getting up at that time in the morning is doing something holy and righteous, you haven't convinced me. Well, Jesus has gotten up. And he's going to spend time to pray with his Father. Verse 36, And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And they found him, and they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. It's the middle of, it's the, middle of the morning. It's early in the morning. The sun's not come up. And they're looking for him. Why? Because the news is spread of all the healings from the day before. And the people are coming, and they don't care whether it's night or morning, noon or night. They are coming to be healed by Jesus. And, he's, and they said, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby in order that I might preach there also, for that is what I came out for. That's what he came out of heaven for. He came out to preach the gospel to everyone. He doesn't want to be stuck just in Capernaum. He's going to come back to Capernaum, so he's going to go start making his way around to the other towns in Galilee. He is the healer, and everybody's come to see him. How many of you people know what a faith healer is? Heard about it, okay? You know, back in the 70s, we had some of these faith healers that they'd come to the edge of town, they'd set up tents, and they they uh, ask you to come to a healing ministry, a healing worship service. And you go to the worship service, and as you walked in the tents, there would be people there, and you wouldn't see the minister at all. He'd be back in the back, hiding away someplace. And the people would come in, and they'd have these cards, and they'd ask you, what have you come for? What kind of healing have you come for tonight? And you'd tell them, and you'd tell them what your prayer request would all. And they'd write it down, they'd ask you your name. And uh, as people would talk to you and say, Mama this, or Papa this, or Nana this, or, or, or Boo Boo this, they'd write down Nana or Boo Boo or whatever, you know. And when the service started later on, out would come the minister, and he would be talking about he, God's healing, and he'd say, he would say, uh, he would say, uh, God is telling me that there's somebody here who they call Boo Boo. Well, if you remind her back, you know, back when Boo Boo was right, the lady was filling out the card. They said, What are you coming? I got back problems. Well, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling much better today. But normally I have really bad back problems. I use that WD 40 and it worked just fine. Today I'm feeling better. I feel God telling me that. There's a person by the name of Boo Boo here, and they've got bad problems. And uh, Boo Boo, raise your hand. Where he's right in here someplace. You're right there. Yeah, yeah, there you are, Boo Boo. Stand up. You've got back problems, don't you? And you say, Yeah, yeah, I got back problems. And he goes over and lays your hands on him, and he shakes that hand a little bit and pushes you backwards. And you get up and say, You're feeling better today, aren't you? Oh yeah, I'm feeling better today. It all came off the card, folks. They're called charlatans. Today, we've got electronics with little ear things and all that. And they meet you out front. And somebody from the back is telling the minister as he walks through. Now, three people over on the fourth row. The prayer card says this, this, this. While he's preaching, he's hearing all this. They're charlatans, folks. There was only one miracle working preacher that could ever do anything like that. His name was Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? Now, the Lord can still heal you, promise you. But the reason why I've told you all that is because I want to tell you. There are people who are desperate for healing. They've got pains and aches. And as you've heard from our prayer list, we got people in this room who if they heard of a person who could heal and there was proof of it, you better believe where they'd be. I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you something. If I, there's a kid that I grew up with in high school that... Actually, he wasn't in high school. He was, in, he was in our high school because he was blind. So our school wasn't prepared for blind people. So he was in this independent little school thing. But he was blind, and I know him. If he had gone to a faith healer and been healed at the 
meeting by this faith healer, and I saw him next, and he could see. He said, once I was blind, but now I can see. I'd think, hmm. And then let's say there was a person that uh, I knew whose hip was out of joint. You know, and they walked like this. And they walked like that all their life. And we knew what the accident was that caused the hip to be out of joint. But they'd gone to see that faith healer, and that faith healer had healed them. That's two witnesses. Folks, it wouldn't take me long to think of all the ailments that I have, and I'd be down there. And you would too. Because there's two witnesses that you knew, have known all your life, and they were healed when they went to see that man. That's what's happening here. These people are taking everybody they know because they know the demon possessed, they know the crazies, they know everybody. They know everybody who's sick that they're going to see Jesus. They're healed. Now, folks, that doesn't work with our charlatans today. It just doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Jesus heals and heals ahead of time. He heals when God heals. When he decides to heal, he heals. And he doesn't always heal the way you want to be healed. But in those days, he was healing to prove who he was. And so the people were gathering all through the nights. They were gathering. So he gets up and he goes. And he goes to the other cities. Verse 39 says, And he went into their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. He's still doing it. People are still getting their demon-possessed relatives and going to the synagogues. So we don't know how many days this is going on here that our timeline has fallen apart where we can say this is the next Sabbath. All right, we don't know how many days this is, but he's going from city to city to city to city to synagogue every day. And he is going in there and people are bringing their sick and their ill, their demon-possessed relatives to the Jesus and he is healing them and they are truly being healed. Verse 40, something changes here. And it's going to change some of the style of the ministry. Look here, it says, And a leper came to him, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying to him, Can you imagine that? A leper. Picture that in your mind. He comes up to Jesus, and he falls at his knees before Jesus. And he says to Jesus these words. Basically saying, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And move with compassion. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. Sternly warned him to say what? I mean, here, here it is. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Yeah, like that's going to happen. He's a leper. He's healed. He doesn't have that stuff on him anymore. You think he's going to keep his mouth shut? No, he's not going to keep his mouth shut. But go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news about in such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. The man didn't keep his mouth shut. He couldn't. He'd been healed by God. And he told everyone. And it got to the point where Jesus could not go into a city. He'd just go to the edge of the city or out of the wilderness, and the word would spread, He's here. He's here. And everyone would run to Him. Oh, how I wish everyone who would hear that Jesus is near, even if it's just in a worship service today, would run to Jesus, would run to him. Well, the leper did. The Lord, the Lord instructed the leper to go do what he was supposed to do with the priest. Now, why? Well, you need to understand. We're not out from underneath the Old Testament law yet. Jesus is here. But until Jesus dies on the cross and says, it is finished, the Old Testament law is still in place. The Old Testament law that Jesus himself as the pre-incarnate Lord had instructed to Moses to instruct the people to write down and tell the people how to do the stuff. The Lord had instructed all of that. And this is the same Lord who's coming to now bring an end to that because that was supposed to arrange the circumstances of which Jesus would come and die and be the final sacrifice for the sins of everyone. And so Jesus says to this leper, 
Go and do what I instructed Moses to tell you all to do if you were a leper to be cleansed. Pretty interesting. Pretty, here it is. I put it in here. Leviticus 14, 1 through 8. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out to the outside of the camp. Thus the priest shall look, and if the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water. As the, for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. He's going to kill one of the birds, take the blood, dip the, bird, the live bird in that blood with the cedar wood, with the string, scarlet string, and the hyssop, dip it in all that. Here's what he's going to do. He shall then sprinkle seven times with a live bird. You got that? Dipped in the blood of the dead bird seven times. Sprinkle the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and let that bird go free. I wish we had time to talk about what that meant. Verse 8, And the one to be cleansed shall then wash his clothes and shave off all his hair, that's all his hair, not just his head, but everywhere on his body, he shaves himself completely, and bathe in the water and be clean. Now afterward he may enter the camp, but he shall not stay outside his tent, for, but he shall stay outside his tent for seven days. In other words, Jesus knew that if this leper had not gone to the priest and done exactly what he had commanded Moses for a leper to do, no one would have accepted this leper back into the city because the priest had not pronounced him clean. It didn't matter whether he had leprosy or not. There was a ritual that the people had fallen into where they said, you, you have to be cleansed by the priest. If you're not cleansed by the priest, you're not really clean. You're still a leper. And Jesus knew that if this leper did not go and do what he had to do so the people would accept him, there wasn't a rabbi who would accept him. There wasn't a Sadducee who would accept him. There wasn't a Pharisee who would accept him or a Herodian who would accept him or a tax collector who would have accepted him or a mom or a pop or a poobah or whatever you want to call the relatives or any of the children would have never accepted him back into the town unless he had been ritually cleaned under the ritual, illogical logic of that ritual system to let him back in. Had nothing to do with whether he's healed or not. Had to do with ever had, had he gone and done the religious thing to get back in. Well, he evidently probably does that so that he can go and then be a testimony for the Lord. That's the reason why Jesus wanted him back in the towns. Well, verse chapter 2 verse 1 says, And when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterwards... We don't know how many days, several days. It could be a lot, okay? He'd gone out. He's outside these cities. He is, he is healing people. He's healed this leper. Uh, he's made his rounds through Galilee, and it's time to go back to Peter's house, go back home. And it was heard that he was at home, verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was laying, or lying. Verse 5, And Jesus, see this point? It's an important point. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, My son your sins are forgiven. By whose faith did Jesus forgive his sins? The four men who brought him, who did what it took to get him to Jesus. Same thing happens over the fifth chapter of James. Whenever someone comes who has the sin of gossip and needs to be cleansed 
from the sin of gossip, and they ask for anointing of oil. It is on the faith of the men who anoint with oil that the healing from the sin of gossip and the tongue is healed. It's on those men's faith, not on the faith of the one who has come. Go look at it. If the verses before about it is talking about gossip and the sin of the tongue, and the voices verses after it are talking about gossip and the sin of the tongue, evidently that verse there in James chapter 5 is also about gossip and sin of the gossip of the, the, the free tongue that can steer a conversation anywhere it needs to go. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They're just thinking, folks. Reasoning, kind of going over stuff. They're in Peter's house and they're thinking about what just happened because Jesus just forgave this man's sins because of their faith. And these scribes are reasoning. They're not even talking about it. They're just thinking it. Boy, I wish I knew what some of y'all were thinking. I'd be a better teacher. Because I wouldn't say some of the things I said probably. Oh, but I'd say some other things that you wouldn't be ready for because if I could know what you were thinking, I wish I could think I could think I could thunk what you were thinking about thunking. Why does this man speak that way? He, he is blaspheming. They're talking about Jesus blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Why can Jesus forgive sins? Well, Jesus immediately aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Which is easier? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say arise and take up your pallet and walk? Which is easier? Huh. Your sins are forgiven. So his sins are forgiven. He's not walking yet. Don't ever let anybody say to you, that the reason why you're sick is because there's unconfessed sin in your hearts, in your lives. They used to tell me the reason I wore glasses was because I was a sinner. <laughs> and if I confessed my sins, I'd be able to take those glasses off and see. I've wore contacts since I was 11. And every once in a while, I'll sneeze up here or cough, and one contact goes haywire. You'll see me up here just doing this, trying to get fluid back underneath it. Is that because I'm a sinner? No. My sins are forgiven. It has nothing to do with the ailments of my body. Not whatsoever. So don't ever let anybody tell you that your faith is not faith enough or you, you'd be able to get past this sickness. You let that person who tells you that get sick and they'll say, please don't tell me it's my, my sins because you know, I've kept myself clean. You can't, that doesn't apply to me. Well, why did it apply to you? Jesus heals him of his sins first. He goes on, he says, um, <clears throat> verse 10, But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, huh, since I'm going to show you I've got authority. So watch this. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. He arises, and he takes his pallet, and he went out in the sight of all, and they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. He is God and he forgave his sins. And even though his sins were forgiven, he still couldn't get up and walk. Jesus then turned and said, get up and walk and get out of here. And he does and everybody sees it. And everybody knows that he has been a paralytic for years and years and years and years. What kind of publicity is this going to give Jesus? If you haven't been to see Jesus yet, you're going to go see Jesus now. That's what's going to happen. Well, so Jesus goes out, according to verse 13, he goes out along the seashore again. And all the multitudes, you know, we don't just have hundreds now, we got thousands here, are coming to him and he, is, he was teaching them. And he passed by, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, who was sitting in the tax office and he said to him, follow me. Levi, Levi's other name is Matthew. Matthew, who wrote the gospel. According to Matthew, he's a tax collector. Tax collectors, just to put it very bluntly, as I tend to put things, was a crook. All tax collectors were crooks. It was the system. Okay, 
well, I don't want any testimonies about today, okay? <laughs> All tax collectors in Jesus' day were crooks, and it was the system. A tax collector, when he went to be a tax collector, had to produce from a region a certain amount of money and turn it in. He was not paid a salary by the government. He had to collect the taxes and turn in a certain amount of money, and he paid his salary by taxing people over the amount that he had to collect. That was his salary. Now his office here probably was not an office, it was probably a table in a well-populated area, which means everybody's out being with Jesus, so therefore Levi, who is not a follower of John, he has not been baptized for the repentance of his sin, he has not asked, been baptized for forgiveness, he has been out there with Jesus because that's where the crowds are and this is a good place to gather some taxes and get rich. In fact, Levi has a house. We know he has a house because of what's fixing to happen. Jesus comes up to Levi and says, follow me. And Levi does the most appropriate thing that everybody should do. If Jesus says to you, follow me, you better follow Jesus. And that's what Levi did. But now let's look at what happens. And he arose and followed him to be his disciple. Huh. And it came about that he was reclining at the table in his house. Levi invited Jesus to come to his own house, the tax collector's house. Huh, and who all was at the house with Levi? And many tax gatherers and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. Watch this. And there were many of them, and they were following him. Too many people overrun that too quick. Jesus had said to Levi, follow me. He had said to Peter, follow me. He had said to Andrew, follow me. He had said to James, follow me. He had said to John, follow me. Levi had followed Jesus and Levi had said, hey guys, Jesus is here. I'm following Jesus. Come with me to my house and follow him too. That's what had happened. The tax collectors and gatherers had started to follow Jesus. That's what made the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders infuriated because they had become followers. Levi invited his friends to follow Jesus. We don't get it in the book of Mark, but in the other Gospels, Andrew heard about Jesus first. And Andrew ran and told Peter, his brother, about Jesus. And when Jesus passed by both Andrew and Peter, they followed him. They were ready because Andrew had told Peter, his brother, about Jesus. Andrew told his brother, have you told yours? Levi tells all his buddies and his friends and all the sinners and they all go to Levi's house and they have a party. They have a party in Levi's house. And it goes on to say, verse 16, And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw this, saw that, G that he was eating with the sinners and the tax gatherers, they began saying to, saying to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax gatherers and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus came for all of those. Folks, most of y'all have been a Christian long enough that you're scared of sinners who are point blank out in the world sinners. You're scared of the thieves and the crooks because you have grown comfortable of being in a comfortable position with people who are like you, who are followers of the Lord. But you're not comfortable with people who've not come to know the Lord yet unless they're just plain nice people. But folks, the world is filled with people who are not plain, nice people. Mildred McWhorter, if y'all remember her, the director of the mission centers that we have, would go out and walk the streets and walk up to gangs as they would pull knives on her and she'd reach over and take the knives out of their hands and tell them about the Lord and hug their necks. Sinners. See, we don't want to do that because... Behold, they stink us sometimes, and we don't want any of that stink to rub up on us, on our new clothes of whatever it is. Well, evidently, Levi has done something that is fixing to 
cause a stink among the Pharisees, the strictest of all the religious folks. He's had a party at his house and he's serving all the people food on a day that he should not be serving food. We're at Levi's house. The Pharisees are coming up and John gives us an intro here in verse 18 and says, And John's disciples, I mean it's the disciples of John's because he's still around, and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? They have a problem here. It's either a Monday or a Thursday or a high holy day. I probably believe it's probably a Monday or a Thursday. The Pharisees by this time have proclaimed that Mondays and Thursdays were fast days and everybody as their disciples had to fast on Mondays and Thursdays of every week. You fasted every Monday, you fast every Thursday, you fast on high holy days, and you fasted on any other fast days of which the Pharisees or the religious folks would pull into and say, you need to fast today. We've called a fast. Jesus is going to answer them, verse 19. And Jesus' answer is going to fly in the face of the Pharisees. Verse 19, and Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? Uh-oh, what's he saying here? Okay. If a bride and a bridegroom get married on a Thursday or Monday or a Thursday, because it's a wedding ceremony, the rabbis said they were exempt from having to fast on those days. You see the hypocrisy here? Everybody's got to fast on those days, but if it's the wedding is on one of these days, which they didn't have weddings on those days very often, but if they did, they were exempt from having to fast. You follow me here? Jesus is saying, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Why? It's a party. It's a, it's a wonderful time. You do not fast on a day when the party is going on, he says. Verse 20. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. He's saying, hey, there's going to come a day, because he's, he's making himself out to be the bridegroom. He's the groom. We're the bride. He's the groom. Israel's the bride. He's making himself out to say that he's the bridegroom. As long as he's with them, you don't need to fast. You don't need to fast at all. He's, he's also pro prophesying here that when he dies on the cross, the people are going to mourn. Because in the Old Testament, all fasting dealt with mourning for sin and things that have been done or death. Death or sin. All mourning happened and they would fast over it. It is something they learned in Egypt. And when they left Egypt, they didn't leave it behind in Egypt. It was part of the religion that were in Egypt, not of part of what the Lord had instructed anyone, anywhere. It goes on, verse 21, it says, No one, he says, sews a patch on unshrunk cloth, of unshrunk cloth and an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new uh, from the old, and a worse tear results. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. Okay. Where does Jesus pick up this idea of the wine skin, of being the bridegroom? Jesus picks it up from one of the books that the, the rabbis know about. It's from the book of Hosea. In the book of Hosea, Hosea is a prophet, and he is the bridegroom. And he is instructed by the Lord to go and marry a certain woman, a woman who is a harlot or a prostitute. Hosea, the prophet, marries a prostitute. And the, his wife does not stop being a prostitute after he has married her. She constantly goes out and goes out to men. And Hosea is instructed by the Lord to constantly go and redeem her and lovingly bring her back. 
And Hosea would turn around. His wife has gone out on a splurge again. And Hosea would go and get her and bring her back. Over and over, repeatedly, go and get her and bring her back. Go and get her and bring her back. And that's what God's attitude is towards of how we should be in our relationship. We should go and get our spouse and bring them back. And God never likes divorce. He hates divorce. He never allows Hosea, who under any circumstances and even the old Mosaic law would allow her him to divorce her. But he wouldn't. And in fact, his wife should have been stoned at the door of the threshold of the door because of her adultery. But the Lord's instruction was go and get her and bring her back. And the Pharisees knew that Jesus was saying, I am the bridegroom and you are the bride and you Pharisees and you scribes are an adulterous bride following someone else besides the true God. And they're infuriated. And he says, you come and ask about fasting? The Lord never instructs in the Old Testament anyone to fast. Even when Esther calls for the fast, it's because it's been a, it, it, she calls for the fast because she's fixing to die, she thinks, when she goes to see the king and she wants her handmaidens to mourn her before she dies. But the Lord doesn't instruct that. The Lord never gives instructions for the fast of Purim, never whatsoever. In fact, in Zechariah, and those of us who've been with me in Zechariah, the Lord says, turn your evil fast days into, I use the word evil, but turn your fast days into days of festivals because they had set up all these fast days, which were days to go and fast when the Lord had brought judgment on them, when Jerusalem had fallen, when the temple had fallen. They, they fasted all these days and morning. The Lord never instructed those days whatsoever. Not one time. And he goes on to say, look here, no one takes a patch of new cloth and sews it onto a hole on a piece of old cloth because as soon as you wash it, what's going to happen? That new patch is going to shrink and when it does, it's going to tear the hole and it's going to be worse. No one takes new wine that's still got to breathe and expand and fill up an old wine skin with it because when you do, the old wine skin is going to burst apart and both the, it and the wine is going to be left, going to be lost. Jesus is saying this. He is saying, look, I am coming to do away with all that old stuff that you, man-made, fasting is man-made, not God-made. And he says, I'm coming to do away with it. And as long as the people have me, they don't need to fast. And that means as long as you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you don't need to fast. That is the Lord's instruction as we got it right here in this scripture. I think I'm through with that topic. Mark 2, verse 30, 23. And it came about. I can show you that in everything, folks. I do have a lesson on fasting. Well, I'll take you every single one of the 21 scriptures and show you how it is not instructed by God. Even when you go over to Matthew chapter 6, the Lord says when he's talking about fasting and giving alms and prayers, he's saying to the people, don't fast like they fast. Don't do that. Just don't do it. Don't pray like they pray. Just don't do it. Don't give alms like they, like they give alms. Just don't do it. Everybody reads that a different way. They read it a different way. That's my understanding of it because it fits the rest. Rest of how about fasting. In fact, if fasting was something that the Lord wanted for the church and for his people, somewhere between Romans and the end of Revelation, it would be mentioned again. And most of you have sat with me through those 22 books. Because we've done them all, go grab them on the website, grab the notes, grab the text, read the Bible, and you don't find one single mention of fasting from Romans chapter 1, verse 1, through the end of the book of Revelation. When we do see it in Acts, one of the times we see it is because Paul is on the ship and the people who worship other gods are fasting to the other gods. And Paul says, hey, stomach's for food. Food's for the stomach. Get you something to eat so you'll make it through this. You catch it? Okay. I guess I wasn't through. Thank you. <laughs> Verse 23. And it came about that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of the grain. And the Pharisees, always with Jesus. Got it? The people are always following you. Jesus is not just going through the grain field through by himself with his disciples. He is going through with all the disciples. He has not even selected his apostles yet. He doesn't have the 12 yet. He is more than 18 months in his ministry and he doesn't have the 12 yet. 
That's going to happen soon, but it's not happened yet. And everybody's following him from the town, and so are the scribes and the Pharisees, and the, the, the uh, followers are picking the grains of wheat, and they're beginning to eat them, okay? And the Pharisees were saying to him, See here, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So Jesus just responds back to them, because that is a man-made law, not an Old Testament law. You understand? The, all the questions from the scribes and the Pharisees are man-made pharisaical laws, but not God's laws. He says, Have you re never read what David did when he was in need and became hungry? He and his companions, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread. Well, of course they had heard that, yes. Which is not lawful for anyone to eat except for the priest. That was because by the time of David, the rabbis had made a man-made law, not God's law, that only priests could eat that bread. It wasn't the Lord's law, it was the priest's law, okay? The rabbi's law. And they gave it to those also, to those who were with him. And he was saying to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Consequently, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here's what's happening here. Back in the story, David is on the run with his men, and they're hungry, and they come to the, the tabernacle. At the tabernacle, there's some stuff called the showbread. The showbread was 12 loaves of bread, about this big around. They were flat because they were leavened bread. There were 12, one for each tribe. They were every, at, at the first of the week, they were brought and put on the, what's called the show table inside the tabernacle. And they were consecrated. And for seven days, they sat there uh, to represent the 12 tribes. When the, on the following Sunday, the new 12 new loaves of bread were made to replace those loaves of bread. And as the priest did his daily work in the tabernacle there, because he served there for a week at a time, the priest, all the priests that served there, would go and they would eat off of this, these 12 loaves of bread for the entire week. David shows up and they're hungry. He's on the run with his men. He's already king, but he's on the run with his men. They show up. You know, I don't know if he's already king or not, because it called him King David. Check that one. I'm not sure if that's true or not, so we'll back up on that. David's on the run with the men, and they show up, and when they show up, they ask to use the bread, eat the bread. The priest says, have you been with any women in the past seven days? I asked these questions, and he's, they said, no, we haven't. We've been on the run. Then you may eat of this bread, because that's the way the Lord laid it out. The priest had made, the rabbis and stuff had made the, the uh, um, the instruction, the law, that they couldn't eat that bread, only the priest could eat that bread. But the priest broke the rabbi's law and said, yes, you can eat that bread. Why? Because the Sabbath bread, just like the Sabbath, is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, the Sabbath is a day of rest. And you've heard me say this before. You need to take your calendar and you need to mark a day where you're going to rest. Because God planned it that way, where He rested on the Sabbath to show us we needed one day of rest a week. So we take a day and we rest on that day. It's made for us to rest. It's not made, we are not made for the Sabbath to be under the bondage of the Sabbath. Well, this flew in the face of the, of the Pharisees. Because the Sabbath was everything. I mean, remember last week, you were not even supposed to eat the egg of a chicken who laid that egg on a Sabbath because it was work. That chicken had to do the work of laying that egg on the Sabbath. You could not eat that egg because that egg was laid on the Sabbath. However, if your ox was in the ditch or fell into a well, you were exempt from working on the Sabbath on that because you could go out and pull the ox out to save your ox. That wasn't considered work. Now, I'm going to ask this question. Which is easier to do, eat an egg laid on the Sabbath by a chicken? Or pull an ox out of a ditch. Which one breaks a sweat? Doesn't make sense, does it? Doesn't make sense. And so Jesus is saying, look, you need to understand. The Sabbath was made by God. And Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath to bring rest to people on that Sabbath day. Well, the next thing's going to happen. He's going to go back into the synagogue. He's going to heal the hand of a leper man. A man that's got, not a leper man, but a man that's got a withered hand. Ooh. That is going to make news amongst all the religious leaders. How dare him?
and we'll pick up on that story next week. Lord, we love you so much for your stories and what you did to prove that you are God here on earth and that you had every right to forgive us of our sins. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Lord, we love you so much in your son's name. Amen.